expected. Uh, not, and rather than being pushy, she was quite demure and, and meek and humble in her presentation of the faith. Never pushed it on, on her husband. But she didn't take any of his junk, and he would shove sort of free-thinking radical literature down her throat, and she would read it. She would read it and discuss it with him, and then, and then throw back in his face all the reasons why the argumentation was bad or poor, it was unconvincing. Uh, but she did it in this constantly humble and generous way, and showed great love and charity to all the people she was around. But what he never knew until after she died is she had a profound mystical and interior life. Um, as Therese lived out in the monastery, so she lived out this, this interior life in the context of a difficult marriage and committed it all to God with, with an incredible relationship with Jesus. And it was only after her death that he became aware, he found the diary um, in her belongings, read it, and he was so moved that this free-thinking radical atheist was not only converted, but he came a, became a priest and a Franciscan friar. And, <laughs> And he was partially responsible for opening her calls, all right? <coughs> and she is, so, so I, I point her out because he, here is someone that, you know, by all intents and purposes, she's fighting a losing battle in a culture that is already gone. Uh, her death is after the separation, all right? And, and yet the fruit of her life went far beyond, far beyond the immediate confines of her family. And at the very least, it saved her husband. Um, Few texts from, from Elizabeth. A Christian is therefore in one sense complete, for his field of thought and action may be as wide as that of the greatest scholar, but at the same time the sphere of the infinite and the eternal lies open to him. And this is an example, I think, of this profound openness of spirit that she exhibited that was the opposite of the kind of narrow-minded bigotry that was attributed to the church in her day. Um, and there is a picture of Elizabeth with her husband Felix and um, she writes in a, she has a treatise on Christian womanhood that's just delightful, um, but it sets a pretty high bar. She writes to her goddaughter and says, you have an intellectual duty, more important now than ever, that your mind be open to every argument from without, discover amid incoherent and varying ideas what is true or useful. And this is what she did, this is how she lived her faith and, uh, and was able to persuade her husband. All right, and then <clears throat> I want to, one last example of the, the, the victory, I think, of the Christian mothers and those like them. Um, Dame Chotard is someone that's not familiar to most people, I think, but he is familiar to, um, to the Holy Father, I'm sure. And uh, I don't know if you remember Father Conte La Mesa, who's the preacher to the papal household. And he came to Birmingham about a year ago or so, spoke at Beeson Divinity School of all places. And he commends Dame Chotard to our attention. Dame Chotel himself was a product of this culture. His mother was a deeply pious and devoted woman. His father was a free thinker and a radical and a nominal Catholic at best. Um, and yet they produced a, a writer and a religious who gave us one of the most important treatises on the interior life in the early 20th century. It's right up there with Gary Lagrange. And Dame Chotel's writing, along with Therese of Lisieux, along with Charles Foucault, if you know Charles Foucault, the religious that went to North Africa, were responsible for an uptick, really a doubling in the vocations in the clergy of France um, in the, in the, uh, uh, about the second half of the first third of the 20th century. Um, and <clears throat> it was specifically his call to the interior life, his profound relationship with God, which he received in, in his own turn from the likes of the confraternity of Christian mothers. Uh, in his mind, the great, the great challenge, the danger to the clergy in France was that activism was going to take the place of relationship with Jesus. And he warned against this in his book, The Soul of the Apostle. It said, feverish activity taking the place of God, the power of prayer, the economy of our redemption, relegated to the realm of pure theory, very common in this age of naturalism when men judge by appearances and act as though successes were primarily a matter of skillful organization, something he warned against said, first you have to cultivate the interior life. And this is why I draw your attention to the spiritual heritage of the Christian mother. Chotard was personally responsible for, for doubling the vocations in France, he along with other great spiritual writers in that period of time. Why? Because of their intense focus on the interior life and relationship with Jesus, the heritage they received from the Christian mothers and those like them, and those like them. All right. His book, The Soul of the Apostolate. And there, of course, is Father Conte La Mesa. Now, I had to throw this picture in because I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can see underneath the, the ambo there, the statues, whose heads he's preaching on. 
Those are the Protestant reformers down there. He's at Beeson Divinity School. In this. Okay. Um, he says, in a moment when there was great enthusiasm for parish works, cinema, recreation, social initiatives, cultural circles, this author, and he's speaking here of Dom Chotard, brought back the discourse brusquely to the heart of the problem, criticizing the danger of an empty activism. God, he wrote, wants Jesus to be our life of works. Um, <laughs> so, what does all this mean for us today, Christian mothers today? How are we doing? in the Catholic Church of the United States. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, while those Americans who are unaffiliated with any particular religion have seen the greatest growth in numbers as a result of changes in affiliation, Catholicism has experienced the greatest net losses as a result of affiliation changes. That from the Pew Forum Religious Landscape Survey. What are the statistics? A third of people raised Catholic today are no longer Catholic. Only 44% of Catholics rank the church as the most important part of their life. Now that's just, think about that for a second. I mean, that's just awful. Um, only 48% of Catholics said they would never leave the church. Only 37% of Catholics attend weekly mass right now. Um, source, William D'Antonio, sociologist. All right. Um, now, if you haven't seen Philip Jenkins' book, the New Anti-Catholicism, The Last Acceptable Prejudice, I recommend it to your attention. Jenkins is a non-Catholic sociologist and historian who, who has written a marvelous book about the cultural situation in, in the elite culture, media, government, and so forth, with, with respect to the place of Catholicism. And basically his conclusion is the Catholic Church is public enemy number one uh, in the eyes of the authorities. Um, and the most troubling, almost as troubling as a sheer abundance of anti-Catholic rhetoric, is the failure to acknowledge it even as a serious social problem. So that's, just, that's what we're up against. All right, but it can get worse. We could be mainline Protestants. 49% of mainline Protestantism has, 49% decline in the last 50 years, worse than the Catholic Church. Um, Episcopal, just to take an example, the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan has lost 22% of its members just since 2000. All right, um, PCUSA had a 2.9% loss in one year. You just do the math. If you compound interest, what happens at 2.9% a year, you're gone before long. Um, now, why, why is mainline Protestantism declining even faster than Catholicism in terms of numbers? Um, now, you know who this guy is? John Shelby Spong. He's a, Episcopal, uh, a retired Episcopal bishop and sort of the head honcho for the non-believing Episcopal bishops. All right. Wrote the book, the Bible, Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism. That kind of tells you his point of view. I love this quote. He says, the only churches that grow today are those that do not understand the facts and therefore can traffic in certainty. Think about that for a second. In other words, if you actually act like you know that you believe something to be true, then you'll grow. But when you admit that we don't know anything, then, then, then you fade. Okay. So the solution to retaining members of any religious community is to believe what you teach. Um, the single best predictor of, of church participation turns out to be belief, orthodox Christian belief. Small surprise that. Uh, sociologist Dean Hoge. Um, and then I want to throw out one other sociologist and I'm going to move on to the Holy Father. Um, the role of Christian mothers, Christian mothers is a confraternity. It's a small group, all right, designed to support one another in prayer and fellowship and works of charity. All right. Um, sociologists of religion tell us this dynamic is critical for the transmission of any religious culture, let alone Catholicism. Peter Berger, he's a well-known religious sociologist, speaks about strong and consistent belief presupposes strong and stable social support, and that's what the confraternity is meant to give. In the end, strong belief and conviction cannot be sustained by fragile plausibility structures. That's what he means by Christian communities, religious communities. All right. So. Strikingly, Pope Benedict has said the exact same thing, that the way forward for the Catholic Church, the way to confront the crisis of secularism, is to focus precisely on unions like this one, what he calls small convinced communities of the faithful. This is how the faith is going to be transmitted in the century ahead, in the mind of the Pope. And I have a, a kind of a lengthy quote that I thought was well worth giving you, leaving you with. When he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, interviewed by Raymond Arroyo, he described this phenomenon. He says, my idea 
is that really the springtime of the church will, will not say that we'll have in the near time buses of conversions or that all the peoples of the world 